We are greeting all hamburger kids today. We have a special episode, as you can hear. It will be in English. Number 100. And we have probably the most precious uh, guest we ever had. I, I, I would say like superstar, economic superstar yeah. here. All right. I love you guys already. <laughs> yeah, it's Brian Kaplan. I'm pretty sure that our listener already heard about you. We have several uh, episodes about your uh, ideas, books, and everything. So I will not try to like, introduce you uh, a lot. J- just that you are an economist from George Mason University. You wrote uh, sever- several books we have uh, here. Uh, actually, two of them were translated to Czech, uh, Czech language, uh, Myth of Rational Water and uh, Open Borders. So mm-hmm. our listener can also read it in uh, Czech and almost Slovak language. And today we will talk about uh, two topics. One is higher education mm-hmm. and second one is immigration. Okay. Which both of them are really like hot topics in uh, our country right now. So, And maybe if it takes longer, we will split it into two parts. So <laughs> the listeners, we said now, but maybe in reality it will be right. two different parts. We're, but not, sli- we're you, not splitting Slovakia into two parts though. That already happened. You know, we are now <laughs> hardcore capitalists. So we okay. want to exploit you okay. as All much right. as, yeah. po- as possible. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> okay, Robert is a big Ooh. fan of the education. So yeah, let's go. So let's start with your uh, the main idea behind your book, uh, The Case Against Education. Could you, could you like uh, sell, th- sell the, the main points in, uh, let's say, five, seven minutes just to, remem- to remember uh, all the important arguments? I, I, I personally love, for example, uh, ship skin uh, mm-hmm. effect, which is really a cool effect. Mm-hmm. Right. There's, of course, a whole way of thinking about the world that says that education is crucial for a nation's economic prosperity, that it's crucial for success in life. And what I do in the case against education is I try to sort out what parts of the story are right and what parts of the story are wrong. The part of the story that's right is that education actually is very helpful for getting a good job and making a lot of money. Not quite as helpful as you would naively think, but still, if someone comes and says, what do I need to do in order to get a good job? The right answer is, yeah, well, do well in school, choose a hard major, excel there, and probably you're going to be successful. However, you say this does not show that education is actually a path to national prosperity. It is not something that has a large effect on economic growth. And I say the reason is because the way that education raises your income is not primarily by teaching useful skills. The way that education increases your income is largely by certifying you or stamping you as being a good worker. A lot of what you do in school is you jump through meaningless hoops Say in America, you do three years of foreign language, and if you do well at the end, you can say, ta-da, look at me, I did this work, which then makes employers more interested in you, even though you will not actually use most of what you learned in school on the job. Selfishly speaking, it doesn't really matter why education raises your earnings, but from the point of view of taxpayers, it matters tremendously because If the reason why it's raising your earnings is that you're getting extra certifications, extra stamps in your forehead, well, what happens to everybody gets more stamps? Obviously, everyone cannot get a good job because they've been stamped. Instead, what happens is that the more people who have good stamps, the more employers raise their expectations for how many stamps you need to not have your job application thrown in the trash. And so we get great waste in, this, in, in these systems. In the United States, well, what I show is that Most estimates say that about 80% of the rise in education since World War II has just gone into credential inflation. You just need more and more degrees to get the same jobs that your parents or grandparents would have been able to get with less. And so I wind up strongly disagreeing with the standard view of education as a good way of developing a country or getting national prosperity. I say really what's crucial is on the job training. The slogan that I like actually is this. Most people think of education as job training, but it's more like a passport to the real training, which happens on the job. The way you learn how to do something isn't by having to sit in a class and listen to lectures by someone who's never done the job. The way that you learn how to do the job is by getting the job and receiving instruction and feedback from people who already know what they're doing. 
By the way, this does not mean that I'm oblivious to the non-economic motives for education. I have a whole chapter in my book about the idea that education improves your mind or your soul or is culturally enriching. Happy to talk about that too. Main thing I say about that is I think those goals are great. There's very little evidence that actual education achieves them. It's mostly just wishful thinking. Would you would you say it's a is a failure of the system or are we more talking about near on a fallacy and that's how the system mm-hmm. developed? Because on the mm-hmm. one hand it's it's a public mainly mainly mm-hmm. public educational system, but on the other hand, it's mostly private companies who mm-hmm. are searching for the seal of approval. So mm-hmm. Is it a failure? Well, the failure, I would say, is that government so heavily subsidizes it that when companies count count certifications, they now expect to have a lot. When education was much less accessible, then companies had much more reasonable expectations for how much education that you would have to get. I mean, really what's going on is companies are maximizing profits given the world that they're in. Businesses don't sit around saying, like a philosopher, like, well, wouldn't it be a better system if we did something else? They just try to work with with what exists. So yeah, I I put most of the blame on governments for pouring so much money into education. Ultimately, of course, governments are doing it because it's so popular. There is so much wishful thinking surrounding education, so many unrealistic hopes about what it's going to accomplish, all of which are fueled by the fact that at the level of one individual, the claims are not wrong. Right? It is true that if one person does well in school, this is a great way for them to get a good job. People then very naturally slide to the conclusion if everybody did well in school, everybody could get a good job. If you were learning useful skills, that'd be true. But if you're getting certifications, then instead everyone does more school and there's just credential inflation, which again seems to be very severe now. But I think that uh, you are not against uh, education per se. Mm-hmm. That uh, You understand that there are some uh, mm-hmm. occupations like... Uh, Programmers, mm-hmm. doctors, I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, civil engineers uh, who need some uh, education. And uh, what do you think? What would be like uh, higher education, which mm-hmm. would, would not be about signaling, but mm-hmm. about improving mm-hmm. uh, capital, human mm-hmm. capital? I mean, even there, I would say that I think education is broadly overrated. People often think that if a field sounds vocational and is hard, therefore you're receiving useful job skills. When I actually talk to people in these fields, they generally will give me a quite different picture. Lawyers, for example, it sounds vocational, right? You go to law school to learn to be a lawyer. Yet in the United States, what do you learn in the first year of law school? The law of 12th century England. That's what you learn in your first year of law school. Uh, For medicine, similarly, would anyone want to be operated on by someone who just finished the four years of medical school? No way. You want them to have actual, practical, hands-on experience, which you get on the job, A lot of what you learn in medical school, you will never need to know again. Everyone, regardless of what area of medicine they're going to practice in, has to go and do anatomy. You have to learn a bunch of obscure diseases. Right? You, you might be in a totally different field where those diseases are relevant, but they make you go through all of those other areas. Uh, computer programming. You know, most computer programmers that I talk to say yeah, their cla- they get a lot of high theory in their classes. The way you become a good programmer is by programming in your spare time, which is what is the actual pathway to most success. Um, now, I am happy to admit that people do le- you learn some useful skills in school. There's literacy, there's numeracy. So it's not zero. At the same time, I will say that I'm anti-education just in the sense of the mythology or the romanticism of education, of just thinking it as just being a higher and better activity than everything else. This is what I will say that I am against. I think of education as a field where there's a lot of grand promises and they've delivered very little given the amount of money they received. And honestly, I will say, I think that private education is a lot of the same problems as public education, at least in the United States. I mean, in principle, you could reform it to make it much more about useful skills. Um, however, uh, as it exists, uh, we just see that it performs very poorly from a from a social point of view. It's, you know, can it, it like... This doesn't mean don't go to school because you're, 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 st- you're stuck in this crummy equilibrium, but it does mean that don't think that things are working out for the best in the world as, it, as, it, as we have it. Things are not working out for the best, not even close. And have you ever heard about a new way how to finance uh, education, especially higher education? It's called income share agreement. Mm-hmm. That st- students are paying for the ec- mm-hmm. uh, education with uh, selling their future wages. Mm-hmm. And did somehow uh, it somehow align the motivation mm-hmm. and incentives of uh, school and uh, students. Right. I'm not going to say this idea will never happen, but it does have some pretty obvious problems. 
Namely, once you have this agreement, it's a reason to not get a high paying job. It's a reason to focus on a job that is fulfilling, but not lucrative because someone else is gonna be getting a large share of your extra earnings. As to how severe that problem is, I don't know, but it's definitely one to worry about. For, right. for, there, is, there is in different kind of caps, you know, on how much you are yes, going yes, to pay. Yes, yes, yes. So you know, which which does does moderate it to, mm -hmm. uh, moderate it to some degree, right? Again, you know, it's it all, you know, what I would say is you know, if it's one where there's no, where the, where anyone can get the deal, it also encourages people to switch over away from high earning majors to low earning majors. If it, you know, if it was uh, done on the market, then you would probably say if you want to do a low earning major, we want a higher percentage of your earnings which would then lead people to cry bloody murder and say, oh, this is so terrible. How can you expect a philosopher to go and make enough money to pay this back? It's like, yeah, well, I don't. And maybe you shouldn't do philosophy then. Maybe you should just read the books and watch some YouTube videos. You don't actually need to take classes in philosophy in order to learn about the subject. It's actually, it's actually already happening. You know, uh, there is like uh, University uh, Purdue. Well, they are charging different mm -hmm. uh, persons for mm -hmm. different... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Types, types right, of right. Edu education right. titles. Yes. Yeah. Now, now, you know, actually, in the, like often in the at least in the United States, when you talk about this, people want to do the opposite of the sensible thing. They want to charge higher rates to higher earning majors and lower rates to lower earning majors in order to have things be more fair. And, you know, I'd say the real problem is that people should be doing the higher earning majors. Taxpayers are subsidizing near worthless degrees in low earning fields, or they're also subsidizing. Uh, destructive majors where people are learning antipathy and self-pity and feels like women's studies, which, yeah, I say, like, you know, these are terrible fields that are you know, not just not preparing people for life. They are preparing people to be bad people. And so it would be better, you know, like, it would be very good if they did not exist. I, I will repeat the question in a broader sense. Uh, uh, I have a feeling in Slovakia this uh, idea that the education, maybe it's not working in the best way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I suppose in United States it resonates much more. Your ideas and generally mm -hmm. the the notion that uh, students uh, are in depth, uh, getting mm -hmm. all kind of strange degrees, uh, has it changed the environment, the educational environment? Because mm -hmm. I remember the now it's old speech of uh, Steve Jobs in front of th those graduates, telling them you will not be like me because I left the school and I started a company and now I'm a rich, uh, rich guy, something like this. So, you know, all this startup community uh, thingy, is it changing the educational environment or not really? It's changing, but not in the way that people want to believe it's changing. Top firms, especially in IT, are extremely elitist, extremely credentialist. They will often say, oh, we don't care at all about degrees. We just care about hard skills. But when I actually then, when, I, when someone says this about their firm, so, okay, how many people do you actually employ who do not have a college degree in, in, in a high paid job? Like, uh, well, we don't have any, but I hear other firms are doing it. It's like, yeah. And where did you read that? In the newspaper. It's like, so you don't actually know anything. This is not based upon your experience in the industry. This is just repeating what you read in the news. It's, 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 this is totally worthless, honestly. Um, you know, there's kinds of changes that are happening. It's not that top firms are becoming open-minded about hiring uncredentialed workers. If anything, it's probably worse than ever in terms of, for credentialism. There has been a decline in traditional liberal arts degrees. People are less likely to do English or history or philosophy. Right, so these are sort of traditional humanities degrees, which are actually shrinking in terms of number of students. But this does not mean that there's a big switch into STEM. The problem with STEM is it's too hard for most people. Most students just wouldn't be able to do it, or at least they couldn't party and to get a STEM degree at the same time. So really, the big transformation in American education in the last couple of decades has been a switch to what I call the fake vocational majors. What are fake vocational majors? Communications. Right. It's a huge major now. It's the degree that prepares you to work in television, radio, journalism. Why is it a fake vocational degree? Because there's hardly any jobs in these fields. You graduate a million people with a degree, and then there's like 10,000 new jobs in the, in the field. So it's not really vocational. You're not preparing them for any job they're going to have. It's just a degree in something or other, and then you go work in a bank. Psychology is very similar. Every year, I think we graduate more new psychology majors than there are total jobs in psychology. 
the result is that to actually get a job in psychology, even to just to be a children's counselor in a kindergarten, you need to have at least a master's degree or maybe a, a doctorate to get the job. So it's not really an actual vocational degree. Uh, business is another one where, again, it sounds practical, but actually it's more of just learning some very basic stuff. And then you get in a job in business and then you learn how to actually do something. So anyway, there has been a decline in traditional liberal arts, but it doesn't mean there's been a large increase in STEM. Instead, there's just a switch from the traditional non-vocational majors to fake pseudo-vocational majors. Not really an improvement, just a change in the kind of waste that you have. Uh, I think that we can agree that uh, mm, you don't have many uh, fans in academia with these kind of uh, <laughs> ideas and a uh, book. Mm -hmm. What would you say that is the best Uh, arguments about uh, against your your book. What is the best case against your the case against education? <laughs> I would actually say that academics have been amazingly friendly to me, considering what I'm saying. The, the most common argument or objection is just that I neglect all the wonderful non-economic effects of education. Here, my response has been. Look, I understand reviewing a book you haven't read. Everybody does that. But reviewing a book where you haven't read the table of contents, that's pretty bad. I have a whole chapter on the idea that education improves the soul. What I say there is we can try to measure this. And when we do, we just don't see much effect. In terms of the best replies, I think the best replies just come down to I'm overstating the numbers. You know, The best replies say, look, yes, your general story is correct. However... We think that it's not, when you say it's 80% signaling, we think that it's more like 50% signaling. For somebody like that, I would say, well, maybe you're right. I don't have any ironclad proof. I do have a number of different ways that I measure the effects or, of signaling compared to other, to compared to other parts. Uh, I think what I did was reasonable, but I'm open to someone saying something else. I mean, I can't say that there have been many people that have actually done the work of coming up with new numbers. It's more like, well, I mean, these numbers could be different. Like, yeah, I suppose they could be. I mean, I, I did the best I could. I mean, I'd be very curious if someone else were to go and do it over. Uh, Tyler Cowan has, an, has a rebuttal that he thinks is really great that I don't think is very good. And this is the one where he says, look, what happens in school is that it, it's not so much what you learn, but it sort of creates a new self-image. And this is really important in life. And they say, well, can't you get a new self-image on the job instead? If people would just go and start high-tech jobs at a younger age, couldn't they learn how to be a high-tech person without the schooling? And I don't think that he really has much of an answer to this. So, yeah, I mean, like, anyway, he's a smart guy, of course, uh, and a great friend of mine. He thinks this is a great objection. I say it's not a good objection at all. Yeah, many people here say that it will make you more complete human. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's more of a humanities professor. I mean, it's one where that's so vague. It's like, well, how would we even know whether you're more or less complete human? I mean, I don't know. Usually it, means, but, you know, it will make you Marxist, but... Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, what I, what I say is, look, let, let, let's look at things that we can measure, like amount of poetry you read per year. <laughs> All right? If you yeah. think that the point of school is to teach people an appreciation of poetry, fine, let's just go and see how much poetry people actually voluntarily read when they're done with school. In the book, what I say is let's bend over backwards to make the case for education by saying let's give credit for all poetry reading to school. How much poetry reading is that? And of course, it's almost nothing. Hardly anyone spends their own time reading poetry. I say the same goes for many other high culture, high, high culture appreciation that schools do try to achieve, but we just see almost no sign that they succeed. Schools are just are not very persuasive. And speaking about poetry... Uh... How many or how much effect do you see of, of this signaling effect in elementary school? I mean, like in mm. first years mm -hmm. of education where people mm -hmm. are learning mm -hmm. how to read, uh, do sure, math. Sure. and Yeah, that's a great question. So that's something that I didn't study very much just because it barely varies. Almost everybody does it. My view is the main benefit of early education, which is totally obvious after COVID, if it wasn't obvious already, is daycare. That's the main thing they do. Right. So during COVID in my area of the United States, schools were shut for about a year and a half. And this is where you can say, you know, you stop doing your actual job, which is daycare. That's the, that is the one demonstrable benefit of school. It's something where parents definitely need it. They definitely appreciated it. Everything else that schools do is speculation. 
What I would say is that in younger grades, it is obviously false that all you do is teach literacy and numeracy. There's a lot of other stuff that happens in school if you just pay attention to what your kids are studying. Therefore, it is false to say that this is all human capital or anything like that. In terms of whether it's signaling or just wasting time, that's a harder question. You might say, look, if a kid were just to refuse to go and do everything other than reading, writing, and arithmetic, what would happen to him, right? And they might actually hold you back and prevent you from advancing, in which case you could say, all right, there's a kind of signaling here where you can actually mess up your future in kindergarten. If you just say, look, I refuse to do this. It's a waste of my time. Uh, that depends upon what your system is really like. You know, in the U.S. probably, they would just pass you along and say, all right, well, whatever. And then no one ever finds out about it. But in principle, you can have signaling at a very early age once you realize how cumulative education is where, you know, in order to get into a good high school, you have to have done well in, in, the, in middle school. To do well in middle school, you have to have done well in primary school. So then you could really say they're signaling back down to a very early age, but it's just harder to say. Well, one thing which baffles me, at least in Slovakia, is that uh, you can have uh, a very good income and quite nice life in economic terms mm -hmm. if you choose a career path of a skilled craftsman, mm -hmm. I don't know, electrician or a welder mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like this. I mean, if you are not completely stupid, it's pretty good chance you will learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. You will get the skills. If you have at least very basic business abilities, you can run uh, as a self-employed and you can really have a very nice income. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be master mm -hmm. of your time and you will be able to find a job whenever and wherever, even throughout the Europe. It's really easy if you are a skills mm -hmm. craftsman. Mm -hmm. Yet, Polish so... Polish plumbers. Polish, yeah, 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 Polish <laughs> plumbers, but... I mean, both of us uh, have been building houses recently, so oh, really? we know a lot of right, about this, right. uh, these guys, and it's really, really expensive uh, and not that difficult. Uh, so my question is, I mean, w many people would be better off mm -hmm. if they chose not to go into expensive signaling, studying mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. useless college, ending up in a corporate mediocre job with mediocre income. Instead, they chose a career path of, of a craftsman. Yet, they are not doing it. I mean, mm -hmm. can you see it in the United States? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is something where there's two different kinds of things at work, and I don't think I know enough to say which forces are more important. One story is that, yes, plumbers have more money, and they can start earning money sooner, but they have low social status. Right. So I, in Denmark, um, you know, there were some Danish guys who told my sons, well, sure, you can make good money, but women won't like you because they, they look down on you. You're not a prestigious guy. You may, you know, you're like rich, but low class is sort of, sort of the feeling. And in that case, you might say, well, maybe this is just standard economics where people are giving up money in order to have more prestige. Right. So that's one story. And I don't think that's totally wrong anyway. But it is always worth remembering that the people that are making these decisions are children. You're asking a child to figure out what his best path and best path in life is. And what is a child going to do? He's probably just going to listen to teachers and parents who have not really thought about it very hard, especially the teachers are obviously not going to push plumbing on a kid. They're going to tell him to go to college. Right. So I think that's another part of it is that these are important life decisions that are being pushed on people who are extremely immature and ignorant about the world. And normally they trust adults to go and give them some good guidance. And yet I think a lot of adults just don't give good guidance. A lot of it based on wishful thinking. Like in the United States, we just have this idea of anyone can succeed in college. Like, well, with what probability? You know, if you have been in the bottom quarter of math for your entire life, are you going to do well in college? And the answer is almost certainly not. In that case, wouldn't it have been much better if you would try something else. Um, yet in the United States, we have a whole occupation of guidance counselors. These are people who work in schools who try to give advice to kids about what careers to pursue. I think you'd probably get fired if you were to say, no, college is not for you. I mean, this is you know, <laughs> classic. You're know, like 50 years ago, that would be the standard thing as a guidance counselor would say, you're not college material, consider plumbing. Now, you would actually get fired for saying that kind of thing, especially if they said, wait, there's a demographic pattern. You're advising kids from poor families or different racial groups to go into plumbing. And so like, so we're going to, like, that's terrible. It's like, why is it terrible? It was based upon his record. You know, I, I'm giving him useful advice, right? So that's something else going on. As to which is more important, it, whether it's just that people are reasonably pursuing status at the expense of money, or is it rather that... People are making important life choices when they are children without good advice from adults because adults are 
so drunk on wishful thinking? I don't know. S Brianom Keplenom sa ešte nelúčime, pretože sa vidíme aj v ďalšom 101. dieli na vršku. Thank you.